you for calling the Hard Rock Cafe Atlanta. The cafe hours are Sunday through Thursday, 11 a.m. to 12 a.m., Friday and Saturday, 11 a.m. to 1 a.m. Oh, hello. Hours, Sunday, hello? 12 p.m. to 12 a.m., Monday you hear me? through 11 a.m. to 12 a.m., and Friday and Saturday, 11 a.m. to 1 a.m. It's 104. Sunday through Thursday, It's 104. And Friday and Saturday from 10 a.m. It's to Monday. 1 it's Monday. If you're on within the hours of operation, please press 3 to be rerouted to the team or email us it's Monday. at Atlanta at hardrock.com. But it's Monday. Monday. 1 o'clock. Thank you for calling Hard Rock Atlanta. My name is Melissa. How may I help you? Hi, hey, Madam Liz. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? Oh, we're doing good. Uh, do y'all have the, the, the gospel music at the Hard Rock Cafe? Giant playlist that kind of plays random songs. We don't have it like set to anything particular. Okay. Do, do you have the live music? No, we haven't done live music just yet with COVID. Um, we kind right. of put all of our live stuff at a pause right now. We're slowly getting some stuff back, but we haven't quite done the music okay. yet. Can, can, can I come and sing with y'all? Can you? You want to hang out and sing? Yeah, I sing. I sing gospel music. I'm from Utah, Alabama. <laughs> Cool. And we're coming, um, well, we're coming to vacation. We have to talk to um, my general manager about, like, you actually wanted to, like, perform or you wanted oh, to I hang sing, out with us? I, I sing, well, I hang out and I sing and, and I talk to people in, in, in friendly ways. And, and but, but I don't want to talk to the manager. Oh, <laughs> I, okay. You don't have just, to talk to him if you don't want to. No, I don't want I'd rather really just sing. Okay, sure. I'll tell you what time y'all open on, on normal days. Uh, we are open currently, but have a nice day. We're open now, and we close at 9 p.m. tonight. Okay. On the weekends, we close at 10 on Saturday, uh, Friday and Saturday. Yeah, no okay, well, we're going to vacation in Hotliner, Georgia. All right, so, we'll see you soon. Yeah, it be this Monday. We'll be up there sometime next week. Okay, we're looking forward to it. All right, and uh, Melissa, All right. Melissa, yeah. that's right. All right, well y'all uh -huh. keep it, y'all keep it hard now. Okay, you too. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Uh -huh. Bye. <laughs> All right, that's the hard rock. Atlanta, Georgia. Music on the way next. All right, it is Sky Bridges Broadcasting, No Rules Internet Radio, and on the phone with me right now out of Pittsburgh, I'm presuming it's Pittsburgh, is Dr. Cyril Wick. How are you, sir? All right, fine. Thank you. I hope for you and all your listeners are well and enjoying uh, nice weather. Uh, um, we've been having some very cold weather here for a while. Yeah, we're doing, we're doing fine, and... Uh, the year of the great pandemic, as I call it. Um, <laughs> you know, it comes and goes, great. but... Uh, damn the damn pandemic, yes, yeah, that's what it is. Uh, I, I dare say police state. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. You know. Um, well, I, I certainly appreciate you taking our call today. I have been enamored with your enthusiasm and shyness. <laughs> over, mm -hmm. over the past several years um, as it relates to the JFK murder and the coup d'etat which seems yeah. to have been successful at least thus far yeah that's right it was successful um, but now let's see on your background you are a forensic pathologist attorney and medical examiner correct uh, yeah, well, I was coroner for uh, 20 years of Allegheny County, two separate 10-year periods. I am a forensic pathologist, and I have a law degree, and I work as a medical legal consultant uh, f doing consultations for attorneys in all kinds of civil and criminal cases, uh, prosecution and defense and criminal, uh, plaintiff and defense and civil, workers' compensation, and uh, uh, you know, I get cases from all over the country and uh, from different parts of the world. I just finished up a, a case um, yesterday. Well, 
not quite finished, but discussed at great length with a homicide case uh, from Israel. Yeah. So um, good cases uh, all over. Um, yes, that's that's my field and has been since I uh, I finished my two years as a captain in the Air Force at Maxwell Air Force Base there in, in Alabama, and then my uh, final year of uh, forensic pathology and my last year of law school uh, in Baltimore. And so since 1962, I've been uh, in practice, uh, private practice, basically. But as I said, uh, that kind of governmental work as coroner. I do autopsies for coroners in four surrounding counties and autopsies for private families and attorneys uh, upon their request. Well, I'm sure that keeps you quite busy. Um, and and you do have a new book out. You said uh, it's been released about three weeks ago. Tell us just yes. a little bit about the yeah. reasoning of releasing this now. Yeah, or? yeah. Yeah, The Life and Death of Cyril Wecht, Memoirs of America's Most Controversial Front Pathologist. That's the title that McFarland Publishing Company came up with. And while I thought it was a little strange at the time, <laughs> I, I think that it's a very, very interesting title and makes people wonder what uh, you know is going on. Um, so the life, uh, my life, and the deaths of all kinds of people, and then my memoirs, um, and I've had a lot of controversiality in dealing with these cases. And the book is available from McFarland Publishing, uh, from Amazon, um, Walmart, the Barnes & Noble, and other bookstores. Right. Uh, I hope people, I think they'll find it interesting. And um, I discuss uh, my life uh, growing up, the problems uh, that uh, I've dealt with then, and then uh, through the educational years, and then into um, controversies involving me uh, here, uh, and then um, touch upon a couple dozen of the cases that I have been involved in, JFK, um, RFK, uh, Martin Luther King, and then on through Elvis Presley and Chandra Levy and Gene Harris and um, Waco Branch Duity and Fire, and then into um, <clears throat> OJ and John Benet Ramsey, and Ron Brown and Vincent Foster and um, and on and on um, and so uh, those are summaries um, of uh, those cases that are contained within uh, this current book. Um, I have uh, other books too that deal with uh, batches of cases in more detail, um, but this case, uh, this book, uh, touches upon many of those cases. And as they say, also touches upon things that people are finding quite interesting about the criminal justice system, about the ways in which it can be converted, uh, perverted, perverted, <laughs> but it's converted, perver yeah, perverted, and, uh, and, uh, yeah, and abused uh, by uh, malevolent people. And, you know, it's, it's a two-way three, not, not uh, strictly Republican or Democrat, liberal, conservative. It's, it's the system. And... Um, uh, sometimes the kinds of people it attracts and the kinds of uh, terrible things uh, that, that that happen and uh, that people uh, really will find quite fascinating. Well, I think so, and I, I personally have always been one to, you know, I certainly love my country, but I damn sure question my government every day. Oh, yeah, and you should, you I, should. I think that's the way it was yeah. uh, meant to be. You know. Yes, yes. And, you know, up until Vietnam and Watergate, Americans were incredibly naive. Whatever the government told them, you know, that was it. And we're still, even now in 2020, we're still finding out some things about the Korean War and the Vietnam War uh, that have been, you know, the, the, I think of all those years, my God. So people say, how can it be? And, uh, and it's amazing how many people... Uh, just trust the government, um, setting aside political ideology, right. not talking about issues that we dealt with in the recent elections. But I'm just talking about um, everyday practices and things. And um, depending upon the politics of some of these people who become prosecutors uh, with ambitions uh, to move to higher office, then, you know, anything sometimes uh, uh, amazingly can happen. You know, in fact, the uh, um, preliminary title of the book, which I had suggested, was um, um, Choose the Victim 
find the crime. Just yeah. think about that for a moment. Choose the victim, find the crime. Um, uh, who do you know, including yourself, and uh, saying this to myself too, um, that if you do a thorough search, you won't find something to go after that individual about, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, and yeah, when it gets out of control, it's terrible. So I think that people would find uh, this book fascinating from that perspective alone. Oh, I, I, I tend to agree. Um, now, you, you may have to correct me, but I believe Vince Foster, at the time of his death, was the highest-ranking member of U.S. government to be found dead uh, since JFK, I do believe. Yeah, you know, I think you're right. Uh, there he was, uh, found uh, at, a, uh, at, a, at a cemetery... Uh, um, and he was a White House counsel and, of course, close personal friend of both Bill and Hillary Clinton uh, from that law firm there um, where uh, um, uh, Clinton had been uh, involved, the Hillary. Firm, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, Rock. right, exactly. So, uh, oh, yes, you're, you're quite right. Mm-hmm. A very high-ranking um, and a very strange. I was consulted by the U.S. Senate Committee. In that re- in that case, well, I found um, it strange that the FBI was not called in, or the yes, yeah. department. It was actually the Park Service Police. Yeah, the Park Service Police. <laughs> the, ca- the cats That's and crazy. jammer kids were not. The cats and jammer kids were available. To, were at a picnic that day, yeah. so they, I mean, they went crazy. to the Park Police. Not not the D.C. homicide, not Maryland homicide, not State Police, not FBI for this guy, this high ranking official, but the Park. Police, yeah, unbelievable, I'm sure unbelievable. They, I'm sure, they did a great job, also. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, it's November, and uh, each year I always think back to Dallas, the twenty second of nineteen sixty three. Yeah. Now, you came on board what in sixty five? Yeah, I gave a paper at the American Academy of Forensic Sciences in February 1965, um, a critique. Uh, nobody really had addressed the Warren Commission report in that fashion, and I did. And then uh, that broke uh, and broke the dam, opened the door, and uh, everything that has followed since that time now. So for uh, those uh, 35 and 20, 55 years, I've been dealing with it. I've testified three times under oath before a federal judge in D.C. when I was consulted by Jim Garrison in the Clay Shaw trial. Then I testified for a half a day, uh, four or five hours before the Rockefeller Commission in 75. And then I testified before the House Select Committee on Assassinations in 1978 as a member of the Forensic Pathology Panel. I was the first non-government related, non-government sponsored forensic pathologist given access to the autopsy materials in 1972. And it was then I pointed out that the president's brain had not been examined and was missing. It had never been examined. It was a place in Formalin, which was a proper thing to do, that hardens it and permits you to examine it in greater detail after a couple of weeks of hardening. It was not Pardon me? It's not there, though, right? No, not there. And it's never been accounted for. Never been accounted for after all of these years. Um, page one story, New York Times, August 24, 1972. Now, other people, of course, many other people knew that it was missing, including top level professionals in my field. And not one of them had the sense of ethics, morality, decency, courage to speak out and say, hey, man, the president's brain is missing. Where the hell is it? We got to examine that brain. And we're talking about two shooters here and uh, one from the front and one from the rear uh, with shots hitting the head. Don't you think it was necessary to examine the brain? Yeah, the brain? I mean, that's um, what we call here common sense, but common sense is not all that common. No. Uh, no. Uh, no. No. But yeah, that's... Um, that's crazy, and it's neither here nor there who who was in the sixth floor unless you're going to do a complete investigation and find out who was atop the grassy knoll. Exactly. And, you're right. Uh, right on target. Yep. But yep. that kind of leads uh, into to JFK's brother, Robert Kennedy. Um, what I basically remember was big old Rosie Greer, uh-huh. a former you're NFL right. football player, being a a bodyguard, but um, right. just um, if you will, tell our listeners, uh, I heard you give a discussion in the, the 
the proximity of where the gun was. Yeah, to, yeah. Uh, right well, I, I ask every audience that I speak to, uh, I love to do it, um, what was the distance of Sirhan Sirhan with his gun from Robert Kennedy when he shot? Robert Kennedy had just won the California primary. It was tantamount to being the nominee for the Democratic Party um, for the presidency in 1968. So they're walking him out uh, through the kitchen because if they try to take him out through the uh, hall there with thousands of admirers, they'll never get him out of there. So he's walking out, and you're quite Roosevelt Greer uh, is there, and he's walking out, and Sarhan is in front of him. And uh, so when I ask this question, people say 10 feet, 8 feet, 6 feet, 5 feet, 4 feet, whatever. <laughs> the distance, the the distance from which the shot was fired, the fatal shot that struck Robert Kennedy behind and above the right ear, behind and above the right ear with a slightly forward trajectory, Sirhan in front of him, uh, and people always answer, as I said, several feet, the distance was one to one and a half inches. That's confirmed in the autopsy report, signed on unanimously, unequivocally, by uh, a dozen or so. Uh, Dr. Noguchi, uh, my colleague, the chief medical examiner coroner who did the autopsy, members of his staff, three professors at the University of Southern California, three civilian forensic pathologists, I being one of those three, and three military forensic pathologists that I suggested Tom to Tom he should consult and get them in there. He called me in the middle of the night to tell me about the shooting of the senator because he was worried that they would try to get the body out of there like they had done with JFK right. quite illegally in Dallas. So I told him one of the things to do, Tom, was you be proactive and invite them to be your guest at your autopsy facility. Um, and uh, th that's what he did. So anyway, uh, everybody agrees. No question about it. Confirmed then by ballistic studies as we do with the same kind of gun and ammunition and uh, on human cadavers and, and so on. A shot fired one to one and a half inches. Uh, no question about was there a second shooter uh, immediately behind uh, the senator who shot when Sir Ann started shooting. That's that's what that case is all about. And Incredible. It sound, and, and I guess none of this came into evidence because, well, evidence, Never. it was there, but... Never presented. Well, the, well, the prosecution, the prosecution was not going to touch it. And amazingly, defense attorney, who was an experienced criminal defense attorney, not some kid out of law school, right. Grant Cooper by name, never, never on cross examination asked Dr. Naguchi to discuss uh, the distance or the trajectory of that of that shot. Never. How do you like that? Yeah, uh, that's yeah. the way things can be covered up. Yeah. I know people, people, they say, my God, I, I didn't know this, I didn't know that. Uh, the naivete, and of course it's not um, stupidity or, or simplicity, but, you know, what can people know if something doesn't get out in a courtroom in, a, in an active trial, then what, what can you expect uh, from, uh, uh, you know, regular folks? How are they supposed to know anything? Well, again, we are told certain things, and we fall in line, and that's right. And, and down the line we go. And then the other, the other Kennedy case, Mary Jo Kopechnia, I was a yeah. consultant in that case, testified before the judge trying to get the body exhumed. There's another case in which medical examiner, can you believe, made a decision. A young woman found floating in a car, submerged in Poker Pond up there um, in, in Massachusetts, Um and no autopsy was done, a decision by a medical examiner not to do an autopsy on, on, on somebody found floating in the car. At the beginning, they didn't even know who she was. Right. And Unbelievable. The I three Kennedy cases, honest to God, the three of them alone um, provide a basis for a forensic pathology textbook. And a big well, part of teaching for uh, pathologists going into forensic pathology on what to do and what not to do and so on. Well, and then, uh, of course, nothing really came out of that because no autopsy. But and, and I think the family, the family objected. I uh, broke my heart a few years ago that uh, her mother said the, the most terrible thing uh, she had ever done in her life that she could not forgive herself was fighting against the exhumation and autopsy of her daughter. Well, yeah, at the bro, time, yeah. I, I could probably understand them not wanting to, but... Yes, yes, um, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. just um, touching on something a little more recent, although it's been 20-plus years, uh, Kurt Cobain. Yes. What can you tell us about what you know about that case? 
I examined that case in great detail. They made a wonderful uh, uh, documentary I recommend people watch, Soaked in Bleach, which I believe is uh, from a song title of his or a, a line in a song. Um, and I studied that case exhaustively, and uh, <clears throat> my opinions are set forth. Um, to get to the bottom of it, I believe that Kurt Cobain did not commit suicide. They found him there uh, with a uh, shotgun by his side. He had injected a huge amount of heroin into his system, an amount so powerful that if it had been divided into equal parts, could have been enough to kill three or four people. And he had this special kit of his own, a uh, nice brown leather case with a syringe and a needle and a tourniquet um, and the drug. Um, and a couple of uh, band-aids and so on. So listen, what the, the, the suicide version is that he shot himself up with that heroin. So instead of being in nirvana and floating high mm-hmm. and everything, he takes the needle out, cleans it off, detaches it from the syringe, puts everything back neatly into the brown leather carrying case, sets it aside, then takes a shotgun and kills himself. You like that? They never conducted an investigation at the Mm -hmm. scene. No kind of homicide investigation. Fingerprints and footprints and fiber and hair and trace evidence. Um, Never, never, never did that at all. There's another example of how a case, a combination sometimes of incompetence, negligence, um, um, a lack of experience, uh, and, uh, of course, uh, the biases and manipulations behind the scene. Well, that and again, people just not using common sense. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, I think That's it, right. I think it was you that I had seen talk about that. You know, thousands of years ago, it may not have been called what we call it today, but people still investigated things back then. They used their common That's sense. That's right. Yeah, I pointed that many times. You're you know. very good. Very good. I thank you. You're right. Going back thousands of years. People had to know, you know, just, you know, when there were so civilizations around and there have been great civilizations on the face of this earth, do you think that they didn't care? Then somebody was found dead or somebody body floating in the water uh, or a, a newborn baby. Was it alive? Was it not? Who was the mother? Uh, of course, they did what they could, but they weren't doing autopsies and they didn't have the forensic scientific techniques that we have today, microscopes on all the way through to x-rays and DNA. Uh, but... And that was the origin of forensic pathology. And then the modern days um, in the uh, 19th century and then on to the present time, uh, DNA being the most recent significant technological advancement um, available to us. Right. Yeah. And um, going to another case that I've heard you speak about that I, someone just the other day brought it up and said, oh, it'll never be solved. I'm like, think about it. And that was the John Benet Ramsey. Ah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I believe on Christmas Day. Yeah. Well, yeah, it won't be solved now. There's another example. Um, um, Although indictments the, were broad. Yeah, yeah. Well, somewhat well, similar to uh, yeah, somewhat similar to Vincent Foster, and um, um, instead of calling in um, trained homicide detectives, in Vincent Foster case, uh, they called in the Park Police. In this case, <clears throat> the local police. Uh, there had been one homicide that year and one homicide the year before. And Alex Hunter, the district attorney, he plea bargained 98, 90% of his cases. Um, so nobody, uh, you know, was much involved in criminal justice. So instead of calling in the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, for this missing six-year-old girl then, um, they just called in the local police. They didn't even know um, about a room there and didn't look into that room until seven hours later when John Ramsey uh, went with his then best friend who became his worst enemy shortly thereafter, yeah, Fleet sure. White, and found the body. Uh, there's no intruder. Um, you know, I think of the great Pittsburgh Steeler, Paul Amato, Paul Amato, who had hair down to his belt line, and I always say to an audience, the next time you see me and I have my hair, my own biological hair, down to my hairline, that's when the intruder uh, who broke into the house did not set off any alarm, knew exactly where the little girl's bedroom was, yeah. uh, succeeded in getting her awakened without awakening her or her brother Burke right next door, three years older, uh, a back set of stairs. Um, and a room in the basement that a maid who worked there um, for six months did not even know existed. When the homicide detectives who came there at 6 o'clock in the morning searching for the 
body of the little girl, did not even find, did not even know there was a room there. But this intruder, he knew about all of that. You like that? Yeah, and then he, and then he, then he looks for pen and, pa and paper to write a ransom note, and he forgot to bring that with him, and he finds yeah. it in the middle of the night, uh, and then he starts to write. He doesn't like his first uh, starting. He throws it away, crumbles a piece of paper, and then he writes this note. We represent a small foreign faction. <laughs> and he asked for $118,000. That's a nice round sum, that was, right? That was a bonus. A yeah, bonus yeah. With, um, which was the, the bonus that yeah. uh, that John Ramsey had received from his company the year before. That is the John Benny Ramsey case. Regrettably, no, it'll never be solved. Patsy Ramsey is dead. Um, and um, while there's no statute of limitations on murder uh, in America, uh, it doesn't make any difference because it's too late now and uh, nobody's going to do a damn thing about it. So there's an example of how, uh, you know, how justice can be thwarted. Absolutely yeah, unbelievable. Uh, minute by minute and day by day, month by month, year by year. But you, you can't keep the truth down if you, if you study it and search for it. And well, you can't unless you've got powerful forces like those involved with JFK. I think top-level CIA military, active, uh, recently retired, whatever. And when you have forces like that that can control and manipulate everything, and in those days, before Watergate in Vietnam, uh, you know, the news media weren't much interested. They just take what the government told them, and so nobody really pursued it. It would not happen today. It could not happen today. Uh, today, you want to run for political office. They want to know if you change your underwear uh, today. They want to know uh, if you pinch the cheerleader's rear end when you were in high school, if you ever smoked a joint. Uh, that's all going to come out today. In those days, you know, you could be sleeping with anybody like John Kennedy did, like Franklin Roosevelt did, like Eisenhower did. Yeah. Nobody seemed to care. Well, that's fine with me. It's a mature approach like they have always had in France. But in America, yeah, that's yeah. not the way it is uh, today right yeah. but it was then not because of our savoir faire uh because of our ultra sexual sophistication but because of our ignorance well and and that's what we try to do is learn from our mistakes and yeah. and, and and move on um yeah. which i mean it, it was just a tragedy with with uh, president kennedy i mean uh, horrible. basically horrible. just a it was a coup yeah, there's no question. It was a coup. It was the overthrow of the government by the assassination of its leader. That's what it was. It wasn't the Chinese or the Russians or the Cubans. Um, and it sure as hell wasn't uh, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald all by himself no. planning and executing that. That's totally absurd. And all the evidence, the scientific evidence is there, pathological, neurosurgical, acoustical, radiological. We've been over this and shows clearly, no question about it, that he was struck in the head by two shots fired simultaneously, one from the rear and one from the right front behind the picket fence on the grassy knoll. No question about it. And, uh, you know, you can't get the goddamn case reopened. Yeah, well... I remember the first time I stood in Dealey Plaza, I said, well, I know who the hell didn't shoot him by himself. <laughs> you know, not, not from yeah. behind because you got the throat yeah. wound. Yeah. And, and then, obviously, the you know, with brain matter going back into the left. Right. The body and then brain matter backward into the left uh, with great force. You're quite right. Uh, you're quite right. And they're saying that that was a shot from the rear. Uh, yeah. A shot from the rear, a bullet of that magnitude at 2,000 feet per second hitting someone in the back of the head is not going to drive the body backward to the left. No. It's going to drive the body forward. Yeah. Well, Doctor, let me ask you just one other, um, about one other case, and that would be yes. the O.J. Simpson case. Yes. My take on O.J. Simpson to get to the heart of it, and I was consulted in that case. I did not testify uh, for several reasons, but I was deeply involved. F. Lee Bailey came to my house and stayed there for a couple of days. We reviewed everything, and then I discussed it with my colleagues, Dr. Henry Lee and Dr. Michael Bodden, then and, and since and so on. What I believe is that O.J. Simpson was there with a second person. And I think that second person was his son, Jason. And I think Jason was there and the situation got out of hand. Um, when uh, Ron Goodman showed up, Goldman showed up unexpectedly and uh, led to that uh, horrible situation with uh, 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 
and Anna Simpson and uh, and on Ron Goldman being stabbed multiple times. So I do think well, that O.J. I mean, was, was... We're talking about a lot of blood, too. I mean... A lot of blood. Where did all the blood go? Yeah. They never found any blood. They said they had a drop of blood on the sock, and that proved to be planted because it had anticoagulant, which is not present in our blood, present only in blood drawn into the doctor's office. Um, where did all that blood go? Where did all of it go? The kind of bleeding that occurs when you lash a slash and cut uh, the arteries and veins in a person's neck and they're struggling and they're fighting for their lives the blood pressure is way up you're going to have blood that's going to shoot off in for two, three, four feet um, where the hell did it all go? where did it all go? Uh, where? what about his car? they find no blood at his home sinks and sewers and showers and bathtubs um, and wash basins not a drop of blood and not the clothing, not the instrument, or so on. No, he uh, he, he took the uh, he bit the bullet for his son. Um, yes. I'm not saying that he should have been exonerated, um, accessory to the murder or whatever. Um, accessories after the murder, but uh, uh, O.J. Simpson did not uh, kill those two people by himself. Right. Believe me, no question. Well, I, I would tend to agree with you. Well, Doctor, we certainly do appreciate you. Uh, getting well, I thank you, sir, for and, taking uh, the time. I appreciate it. And, uh, I hope uh, your listeners will be able uh, to think about that book, The Life and Death of Cyril Weck, the uh, um, uh, Memoirs of America's Most Controversial Forensic Pathologist, to get into some of the stuff that you and I have been talking about, these cases and other things in the criminal justice system. I thank you very much, and I wish you and your listeners uh a healthy week and a, a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday. Right. Thank you, sir. And it is Thank No you. Rules Thank Internet Radio. Music okay. up next. Thank you.